All right, it's Johnny D, the Motivational Cowboy, and I am sitting with Bill Melbach in the studio with Paul Long. What is going on, guys? All right, all right. All right, Paul, you downstairs? I'm right here. Hey, guys, listen, man, today's guest, we are going to call him right now. We are going to have Blake Cook on the phone with us. He is founder and co-owner of Filter Time. Hi, I'm Dallin Hart, Jr. As busy as I am, I'm all the time forgetting to change my air filters. And that can drive up my energy bill and it can wreck my HVAC system. But now I have filter time, a box of brand new filters that get shipped right to my front door automatically, reminding me to change them. It's the same price as the store. There's no contract, no fees, and shipping is always free. So give yourself one less thing to worry about and go to filtertime.com today. I'll tell you what, this guy, I used to uh, interview him all the time at the races and stuff like that. He used to drive a Chevy Camaro. It was awesome. So we're going to put him on the phone, and we're going to have a great podcast. You guys ready for this? Sweet. Sounds good. Hey, Paul, if you don't mind, can you uh, call Blake? All right. I think I got him on the line right here. Blake, you there? Yep, I'm here. What is going on, buddy? What's happening, guys? Man, it has been a couple years since I um, physically saw you. But, man, one thing about you, Blake, is is you were always so much fun. I mean, it is 9 o'clock in the morning, and I don't know who has more energy right now, me or you. Do you wake up like this? <laughs> you sound like you have more than I do. I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> so what's it like now, man? Um, you know, you um, you're not racing anymore. Yeah. But 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 you are still, you know, a husband, a father, race car driver, TV host, and now business owner. You are founder yeah. and co-owner of Filter Time. Man, I, you know, when all this happened, um, I, I have to say, Blake, I am so proud of you. I mean, you talk about somebody that um, um, has a great story. Um, I want to jump right in with 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 you being a race car driver. And and you know how how important sponsorship is, and you had an awesome ride, a fast ride. You were working with a great team, and like other drivers, you lost your ride. And instead of being mad about it, you went to work. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's right, man. I mean, in life, things things happen, you know. And and I was, I would say about two years before I lost my ride in NASCAR, I was like, man, am I giving it my all? Am I doing everything I can possibly do? If I lost my, my ride now, if everything ended, could I look in the mirror and say that I truly gave it my best? And at that time, the answer was no. So luckily, 2016, I gave it everything I had. I hired a coach. I hired a personal trainer. I practiced public speaking. I did, I did eye racing every night. I truly for the last two years of my career, worked as hard as you could possibly work, gave it everything I had and poured all my passion into it. So when that when that career came to an end, it was a lot easier to deal with because I knew that, man, there was nothing else I could have done. I honestly was the best at promoting my sponsor, drove as hard as I could every lap on the racetrack, was in the best physical and mental shape I could possibly be in, and I lost my ride. So – it was easier for me to um, <laughs> to lose my job when I knew that I gave it my all. And right. I'm very, very happy that I did that. And that helped me moving forward in life, too, knowing that whatever I do next, I know I need to give it my all, do my best, treat people awesome, and whatever happens, happens. But when you, when you run into disappointment in life, right, you have two options. You can either blame things on other people, pout, or – Pick yourself up, move forward, and start fresh. And I decided the the latter of that. <laughs> so, Blake, how long did it take you? Could be because you're right. I mean, you do have to pick yourself up, and and even when you give it your all, but did, but there is still that that little lag time. Was it a yeah. day? Was it a week? Was it a month? That and, then, and you're like, okay, now it's over. I I, I can't. You know, the pity party is over. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you, you know, know what I'm talking probably, about? It. Oh, of course. It's natural. It was probably three days. Okay. Where I was like, man, like that wasn't fit. You know, well, you also let people kind of control your emotions too, right? You get people that call you and be like, hey, you got the bad end of the deal, this, that, fans, you know, and they start 
making you question yourself like, oh, was I in the wrong? It, but in reality, it's business. It's business, right. And it was a business decision that was a smart decision on the owner's part. And you have to respect that. And especially as a business business owner today that I am, I totally understand um, why the decision was made. So I would say two or three days, I was kind of pouting, whatever. <laughs> and like making phone calls, being like, you know, I'm the guy. And then, and then I probably tried to get a ride for like two weeks, calling sponsors, and I was hustling, man. I was I was trying to drive other type of series, rally cars, drag racing. I talked to NHRA. I talked. I what? was like, really? I need to drive something. Yeah, I you, need, I need you, to drive something. You were oh, you were do. ready to go 300 miles per hour in a quarter mile. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow, I didn't know that. But yeah, I, I, I know I you were. <laughs> yeah, right. You were on a mission, though. You were you were definitely on a, um, a mission, and I remember all that. You know, obviously, I follow you on social media, and 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 you were so inspirational to to a lot of people because you didn't give up. But I want for for the you know the the people that don't know about racing, you know what I mean. This is the outstanding life podcast because you are an outstanding individual that has a great story. When did your racing career um, start? Like what age were you? Yeah, it's, it's a little different than most people you would ask. I was actually, well, I started racing dirt bikes when I was nine years old. Wow. So I raced okay. motocross. Well, even nine years bikes. old is uh, for motocross in these days. Yeah, it's, it's pretty it's, late. It's pretty yeah. late. You were late to the my, game. <laughs> my son's seven years old and is nationally ranked at seven. So I yeah. love that. <laughs> I was pretty late to the game. And then I didn't even watch my first NASCAR race. You, you might not even know this, Johnny, till I was 20 years old. I watched the 2007 Daytona 500, <laughs> the first NASCAR race I ever watched. And I was like, man, that's crazy. Uh, Boyer's flipping on fire. <laughs> Kevin Harvick passes Mark Martin like with an inch for the finish line. I was like, that's pretty awesome. And then I, I got my first race car a few months later. My stepdad bought it. Um, and I started racing in 2007. So, so, so I was 20 years old. So you were 20 years old, never watched it, never did anything. Um, what what made you even think about it? Well, I was I was done racing motocross because of all the injuries I had at such a young age. And I went to college for business management and marketing. And in college, my stepdad, who's the one I grew up racing dirt bikes with, was like, man, we need to race something, you know? <laughs> and then he found out about this local series where we lived called the Pro Truck Series. These yep. all stock trucks you race. And uh, he's like, hey, if I buy one of these trucks, would you want to drive it? I was like, mm, not really. You know, <laughs> it looks kind of boring going in circles. <laughs> is is what I told him, and he's like, okay, well, we'll let, we'll just let our the neighbor try it out. Eric was our neighbor, and I was like, well, before you let, let me just give it a shot, make sure I don't <laughs> like it. And uh, all it took was one lap, feeling that motor, going around that track as fast as you can. I was hooked uh, for the first lap on the racetrack. So the the rest is history after that. Wow, and then and then you end up racing with some of these guys. I mean, you yeah, you know, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I growing up racing dirt. There, there's no other sport that builds your confidence like motocross, right? Dirt bikes. The amount of effort you put in is the results. It makes you tough. You build your confidence. So when I when I got in that race car, I was like, well, this isn't that hard. If those guys can do it on TV, I can do it. It's just a bigger track, <laughs> right? And that was my mentality. It really was. So I, from, you know, I decided I was going to be a NASCAR driver. I thought it'd be fun. Can make a good living. And, um, and if they could do it, I could do it. It was my mentality. So you went from those, those pro trucks to then what? To a late model. Okay. Um, so I ran the pro trucks for one year. I ran the late model for one year. And then after calling all the NASCAR teams every day for months, I finally got, you were one of those guys, huh? I was one of those guys. (laughs) Yeah. I remember calling RCR and talking to Mike Dillon and, uh, I was like, Hey man, I'm your next champion. I'm your next guy. He's like, well, how many championships you won? I was like, well, n- none yet. I've only <laughs> raced for two years. Um, but I was like, just give me a shot. And and he's like, just keep me updated, you know. And I made those phone calls like, you know, maybe a month after I started racing in the pro truck. Wow. I started making the phone calls. I was like, I'm I'm going for it. So I kept in touch with those guys, filled them in on my, you know, pro trucks, winning some races, late models, win some races, and then I got a call that hey, we. If you could, if you could uh, come up with a little bit of sponsorship, we'll run you in our backup car at the championship race for our K and N series. 
Oh, wow. And it was it was a really great deal. I mean, it was very little sponsorship. I basically had to pay my way to get there. Right. And I got in that car, and I ended up out qualifying their primary driver, qualified <laughs> third, I think, <laughs> and I got signed to a two year development deal. Oh, that is awesome! So, so, yeah, so then so you get that deal, cool. and then mm-hmm. where? Then I am racing, you know, for Richard Childress Racing, doing photo shoots with Jeff Burton, and um, you must man, have been I in should... heaven. I, I mean, I've only watched, <laughs> I just watched NASCAR two years before for the first time, so right. I didn't even really, it wasn't even that big of a deal to me, other than like this is where I belong, right, right, you know, with, with my mindset. So yeah, just started racing, started racing for a living and, you know, everything's great. Uh, proposed to my wife, we get married and then you, I made my first Xfinity series start uh, in 2009. So 2007 was my first NASCAR race I ever watched. First time I drove a pro truck. 2009, I made my first Xfinity start. And uh, and then it started being a roller coaster career <laughs> at that point. Blake, I'm just going to stop you right there. You you said something a couple times, and you said mindset. You had mm-hmm. your mindset on being that next driver, that yeah. next person. Yeah. Did you always have that mindset as a kid growing up? Did you always have that confidence of, hey, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to give it 100%? I did, yeah. I, I uh I have to be the best at everything. So, like, I can't just have a hobby. You know, if I start skateboard, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to be a pro skater. Right. Uh, you know, if I was in the, I started playing the drums just as a kid and I wanted to be in a band. I can never just do something for fun. Uh, I started bass fishing in Florida and I started researching how to be a professional bass fisherman. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm dead serious. So it's like, yeah, to answer your question, yes. Since I was a kid, I always thought, man, I can be, I want to be the best. I want to be pro, really. I just want to be pro. So so now your son is racing, and does your son have the mindset that dad does as well? He does, um, and he has more confidence. So, Well, and he's nationally ranked, so yeah. should we have him on <laughs> the show? <laughs> yeah, I know, man. I know. I just, That's pretty I awesome. I just got home from a little father-son breakfast at school. It's called All Pro Dads. It's really oh, very cool. cool. Um, but man, you know what he, the difference between him and I is I wanted to be pro, right. But I never really saw myself as like a champion and the best as a pro. I just wanted to make it like if I made it pro, I was good. If I could get paid to do what I like to do, I was happy. My son wants to win. And like, we went to these national races and he finished sixth in the nation. And I'm like, that's awesome, buddy. It's cool just to qualify for this event. <laughs> right. He's like, I basically finished last, you know, like he, he's seven years old and, and he doesn't show up to the racetrack and hang out with friends or have a good time. He's there to win. So he has more of that winning mentality than, than I had as a kid or even as an adult, to be honest with you. So let's talk about you. You, 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 you brought it up and I was going to bring it up later, but since you brought it up, how did you meet your wife and how did you propose to her? <laughs> Man, nobody's ever asked me that question. How I proposed to her. Well, this is a different and, kind of podcast. <laughs> yeah, nobody has ever asked me, so I'm excited to answer. So I met my wife. Um, I, I was stay, you know, I stayed at my friend's house in the summertime as a kid. I was 14 years old and just spent a lot of time at my buddy's house. And she was his neighbor. So I met her when she was 13 years old and I was 14 years old. And we were kind of like had a summer fling, you know, like you're holding hands, you're going to the movies. And, and <laughs> we, we met at that age. And, and uh, when the summer was over, we broke up, but still stayed friends for years. And then when we were 20 years old, um, we just connected again and, and started dating. And then, um, you know, we're dating for three and a half years or so. And I I had known her for, you know, 10 years now before I'm about to propose. So it, it's pretty cool. So to propose to her, I was like, oh, man. I mean, I, I would just wanted to be real. Like, I'm not a real romantic guy. Like, I'm just not. And um, I was like, hey, let's grab some Wendy's and go to the seawall in Florida. <laughs> like, on the intercoastal. It was kind of where we had our first date. Right. So I like kind of try to reenact our first date 
And um, she was driving separately, so we drove to the Wendy's drive through and, and I ordered first, and then she ordered behind me, and then, of course, I paid at the window for the okay, car Okay, I was going to ask you if you paid for <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, and that was the romantic part. Did you at least get her, like, a double or something? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, probably, I don't even know what she ordered, but I just <laughs> paid for it. And That's then we funny. drove about 10 minutes down the road to the intercoastal, the seawall, and, uh, and I put the ring in her Wendy's bag. And um, and I'm like, I sat down and I like handed her her bag. I'm like, here you go. Like, here's your dinner. And she reached in to grab her burger or whatever it was, and she pulled the box, you know, the ring box out. And uh, and then of course I had to like propose, you know. And uh, she said yes. So yeah, I proposed out of a Wendy's bag. <laughs> wow, Blake. <That's> cool. <laughs> uh, I I would have never expected that answer from that question from Blake Cook. <laughs> I love I it though. He's so such a simple, simple guy, Blake. One thing, um, and and I don't know this. You know what I mean? Nobody knows um, a person's relationship at home, but it seems like you and your wife are friends, lovers, and you know what I mean. It's like at least that's the way it looks. But one yeah. thing that I always took from you, you said something one time on stage in in a question, and I, I said, "Oh, what'd you do this week?" And you said, I went on a date with my wife and we started dating again. And you said once a week or once a month, you would take your wife on a date. Do you remember this? Yeah. And, and, oh, and, yeah. and, and I don't know if you're still doing this or or not. And, and you said, listen, it's important for a married couple to spend time together, even though you love your kids and you love everybody around you, but you, you, you need you, time for yourselves. And, and you're like, but I learned something the other day, John. I learned this talking to the guys uh, that I'm in Bible study with, and they said, hey, listen, that's great you're having um, date night, but your wife doesn't want to go to the go-karting track all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you remember? And, and, you're, and, you're, and you, were do. doing, you were doing things for you. And, uh-huh. and, and, and there was one time you told me, you're like, hey, guess what? You, you jumped on stage, you go, guess what I did on date night last week? You're so excited to tell me. And, and you said, I went painting with my wife. I listened yeah. to my friends. So what what have you guys been doing on, on date night lately? That was the last time I went painting. <laughs> <laughs> so Man, so, uh, so do you guys... Again. Do it's you, way more fun. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, are you... I, I know how competitive you are, but are you competitive even with your wife? Like if you, if you take your wife go-karting, do you go out and you set your mindset to beat her? Oh yeah. 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 Actually on her Instagram yesterday, she did a post about this because, uh, well, first of all, let me, let me answer your question. Yes, we still date. It's it's so important to invest in your marriage and we are best friends. And, um, I have it written on my whiteboard right here, along with all my business stuff, right? It is continue to be the best husband and father that I can be. And that is priority number one is to be the best husband because kids are going to be out of the house. And if we have our life revolved around our kids, when they're 18 and maybe we're not going to even know what to do with ourselves. So we try to make it a priority to put each other first, put our kids to bed early, get rid of them and have, you know, time together, go on date nights, get a babysitter. Uh, Even though sometimes it feels like we're not with our kids enough, the priority is being with each other. Yep. So thank you for that question. But here, getting back to the fun part is (laughs) – (laughs) <laughs> she, she's like we're, we left I had to meet her at my daughter's gymnastics on Wednesday night I was having a meeting um, and I was running late so I had to meet her there and gymnastics is over and, and we're driving home separately I don't know if everybody anybody else does this but if you're driving home separately it's a race like <laughs> It's a race to see who gets home first. And I could tell she pulled up the stoplight and she rolled on the window and Carter's like, we're going to beat you. I was like, okay, (laughs) you don't have a chance. And we turn and I'm blocking lanes and I I, like she, then she stuck behind me on a one lane road and I called her. I was like, I hope you didn't really think that you could beat me, you know? Um, And she's like, it's not over yet, whatever. And then we get kind of close. And then I, I chop her off pretty big. And then she called me. She's like, you're crazy. I said, listen, I'll wreck both of our cars before I let you beat me home. So, um, I won. I won. And then I rubbed it in her face and running around the house with my hands up in the air because I won. So, 
Yes. I'm very competitive. On, I won't let her win at anything on purpose. Are you guys still pranking one another? Uh, not as much. <laughs> not as much. My, Carter does it now. Oh, the, yeah, you, bad. you, no. you guys really got into that whole pranking thing. And a couple of times I was like, man, someone's going to get hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> she cried one time really bad and it made me feel bad. <laughs> you know, Blake, you just brought something up and, and, um, and I want to share something with you and you brought up the word time and time mm-hmm. is so important and, and you have young kids, but let me tell you what happened to me just um, this past week. And Bill, you don't even know this story yet. And uh, Paul, you don't either. But uh, my daughter calls me and Blake, my daughter's 27, going to be 28 years old this month. And um, she says, hey, dad. Or no, she sends me a text. She goes, dad, how about um, matching tattoos? Or no, no, she didn't say matching. She said, how about a, um, we each get a tattoo? I said, cool idea. What are you thinking? She says, um, a timepiece. I was like, okay, cool. I said, call me on your way home from work. My daughter, my daughter's a clinical psychologist now. Yeah. And um, I said, so she calls me and she's like, hey, dad, what's up? I said, nothing. I said, hey, I, you know, great idea about getting a tattoo. I go, you have a lot of them. I only have one. I'm like, but if you don't mind me asking, Jess, I said, why a tattoo of a timepiece? Guys, this is what my daughter said to me. And I'm going to try to say this without crying. My daughter says, dad. Do you remember when you didn't have nothing and you would take me into the park and you would always just tell me spending time with me was more important than anything else? Wow. And she says, Dad, you have more than you ever thought you would have and you still find time for me. Man, that's so cool. So I I, I tell you that story to to just keep doing what you're doing, man, because, you know, it, it... Everything you're, all these lessons you're, you're, you're telling your kids, sometimes they fall, you think they're falling on deaf ears, but you know, when they're adults and, and they go back and they tell you something like that, let me tell yeah. you something. I, I hung up the phone with her and I went to, um, went into the other room and I was sobbing like a little baby. I was like, wow, <laughs> she really listened to me. Like my yeah. daughter, like all those little lessons going to the park with no money. Wow. Cause that's all I had. I didn't have no money. I was following a dream. Yeah. I was yeah. going to be, I, I was going to be a speaker. I didn't, I had nothing. And, and she remembers those times of having nothing, but having mm-hmm. the time, you know? Wow. So anyways, yeah. that's awesome. So anyways, that just don't cool. ever forget that, Blake, don't ever forget time with your kids and your wife. And I think that's so important. And I, th- I, I commend you for what you do every single day. You know, you, you talk a, a lot about working out and, um, I know that, um, you are now training other athletes, but how did you get your start and who did you start working with? When you went to somebody or, you know, when you wanted to get in better shape, you went to somebody and said, hey, listen, I want to get in better shape. Is that kind of how it happened? Yeah, it is. Um, for, well, for one, did you get the tattoo? Not yet. No, yeah, he it, was not, trying okay. to work. A, he was trying to work that in. He actually got a, a tattoo of your face. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> he did it in honor. Of, I want to see for the, the tattoo. Podcast. <laughs> so yeah, so we we actually um she you know we've been uh, you know she just came over last night and we are talking and and we want to get like an old fashioned like just timepiece. So um oh, yeah, that's cool. That's, that's very cool. Me and my dad just got tattoos together on his 60th birthday one year ago. Uh, really, it's his first tattoo. Oh, Is it wow. your and first me, one too? No, it's not mine. Um, but me, my two brothers, and my dad went and got tattoos on his 60th birthday. What'd and you get? Th- I got a cross. My dad got a Fusions verse, and oh, my other cool. brothers got a cross. So it was really neat. So she's going to really appreciate that time when you go get a tattoo with her, too. So. I think, the, I think though, that the, the, my, my very first tattoo, yeah. I, I got an old-fashioned microphone on, on my back shoulder, and it says around the it's an it's an old shear fifty five. Paul, I know you'd like that. Um, and uh, it was the one that like Elvis used. You know, it was like one of those really yeah. cool ones. And it says living the outstanding life around it. Well, my nice. daughter said, "You are not going to get that tattoo, Dad, without me being there because I want to see you cry." <laughs> and, and she goes, and she was so bummed because it didn't hurt that bad. Yeah. You know, like, it was it was really really uh, painless. And uh, she's like, okay, well, I hope the next one hurts you a little bit more. <laughs> so, funny. yeah, we are looking forward to, do, you know, doing that, you know, together. That's yeah. so good. So you so look, working you, out. yeah, working yeah. out, man. Now, now, now you're working on the, on, on, on the, uh, on the mind. Now you want yeah. to start working out, you know, physically. 
Yeah. So at the time, there's no there's no motorsports trainer available for NASCAR drivers at the time. There there's there was nobody, um, and I started looking into another sport I'm a big fan of, and that's motocross and supercross. What I grew up doing, what my son does now, and the best trainer in the world with the most championships is Alden Baker, and he's oh you know a name known around the world for developing. Um, motocross riders into champions and me and Trevor Bain called him and we're like, Hey, we, we know you don't do NASCAR drivers, but we want to, we want to be in the best shape we can possibly be in and, and not have any excuses of why we're not giving it our best effort. We don't want to be tired. We want to maximize our opportunities. Will you help us? And he said, yeah. And we flew down to Florida and me and Trevor met with Alden and stayed with him for a few days and, he did a bunch of tests. He did blood work. He put us on diets that were uh, specific to our blood type. And man, for two years, I didn't eat like a normal person. Like I, I didn't have <laughs> red meat, cheese, dairy, or sugar for almost two years. Not one cheat. I remember asking Alden, I was like, hey, what, you know, this diet sounds good and all, but do I get a cheat day or like a cheat? you know, a week. He's like, no, mate. He's from Australia. He's like, no, mate, no cheat meals. So, so was I, it like I, a plant-based diet? It pretty much. I mean, we okay. could have chicken and fish. Gotcha. Um, but it was just really, really clean, a uh, very, very disciplined diet. But man, I'll tell you what, I was in the best shape of my life. I was 4% body fat. Um, I got done with a race feeling like I just started and it was incredible. And I learned so much from him uh, and as a person, great Christian man, and uh, just kept me motivated, kept pushing me to be the best I could be. And, and as a race car driver, too, it's always easy to make excuses. Oh, my car was this, my car, you know, bad pit stops, this and that. And he always pushed me to think about what I could have done better. You know, well, did you do everything you could do the best? And like, you know, most drivers would be like, yeah. But like, if you really think down and deep, probably not. There's probably other things I could have done better. Maybe mistakes that could have been avoided. So he really pushed me to put a lot of the, a lot of the, um, you know, I would say pressure on myself, but good pressure. Um, you know, it just kept me accountable to to be the best I could in every area of my sport. Do you think that staying mentally and physically in the game while why while, while you guys are racing does that help? or give you an advantage? It does. Yeah. I mean, for one, it's just confidence, right? When you, the biggest part is in NASCAR, when, when you unload on the racetrack, your weekend's kind of already, you know, done. Right. You're not going to unload 20th and somehow find a winning race car out of it. Right. So <laughs> as a driver, when you walk in the garage, you know, you, I felt like I was the best. And I walked in and felt like I was the most prepared, worked the hardest, in the best shape. I'd look at guys drinking a Mountain Dew and be like, look at this guy. They, they, have, they don't stand a chance. <laughs> and, and I think that was the biggest part. I got my race car strapped in like I was the best because I was working the hardest. And hard work builds confidence. Right. Um, so – and then, of course, yeah, actual physical condition. It was a huge advantage, keeping your heart rate down. When your heart rate's lower in a race car, your vision's better. Your hand-eye coordination's better. And you, you're just body's more efficient at a lower heart rate. So, you know, training your body to operate at a lower heart rate just helps everything for an athlete. So that was that was definitely a big improvement. You were doing a lot with kickboxing and working with the like the like the MMA workouts and stuff like that. Did you ever did you ever get in the cage and fight? No. As much as you no. worked out and as tough as you looked, did you ever get in the cage? I sparred, like I sparred, but that's different. You know, I got punched in the face, but like <laughs> I started thinking, man, I really don't want to go and get kicked in the head, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or someone's shin hit me in the nose. Like, oh, <laughs> never had a basketball hit you in the nose or like jump down and your knee hits you in the nose. It's the worst pain yeah. ever. So I was like, so man, professional fighter was out of, out of the uh, question then, no matter how it much was, money, but I would box, I would do a boxing match. So like, and I've thought about it. I still don't think about it. 
Um, I would definitely go do, you know, a, a fight with for boxing, but not the MMA, someone trying to dislocate my shoulder on purpose. Like, <laughs> no, nope, not doing it. You, you know, I was um, looking good, feeling good inside that race car mentally, physically. But, you know, even even the fire suits that you guys wear, you know, are custom made to your bodies. You know, you guys always mm-hmm. looked really, really good. But one thing I learned yesterday we have a mutual friend, and I don't know if you knew this, but he has actually been on my podcast as well. But Greg for, uh, Greg Stump from Off Excess Paint, you yeah. were the very first Xfinity driver to work with Greg and the boys. Did you know yeah. that? Oh, yeah, I do. I do. How, um, why, why is it so important for you drivers to have a custom helmet painted and created for you? Well, well because it's kind of like, I mean... I don't know how to compare it to another sport, but it's like, dude, I got a custom helmet. That means you're like big time. <laughs> you know, when you're racing at the local level and, you know, dirt cars and pro trucks, you don't have a custom helmet. You know, these things are expensive. And you don't, you know, you don't, you just don't have it. So, like, when I was in NASCAR, like, oh, you got to have a custom helmet. You got to have your sponsor on it. And it's just, it's just part of it, part of the look and the feel. Um, but with Greg, so I'm pretty cheap too. Like I'm not going to go, <laughs> I'm not going to go, or at least at this point in my rookie year, I wasn't going to go buy, pay for a custom helmet. So I was running a standard black bell helmet at the time. And Greg Facebook messages me and said, Hey buddy, I would, you know, I would love the opportunity to paint your helmet. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, I was like, how much? He's like, I'll do it for free. Just, uh, just send it to me. Here's my address. And I was like, perfect. I sent him my helmet. He painted it. I got it back in like two weeks. And it was the best paint job I've ever seen in my life. It was incredible. It was awesome. And he just hooked me up and he wanted it. He wanted it bad enough where he didn't even get paid to do it. I love it. And um, and it was pretty cool. Then I introduced him to Justin Allgaier. And then Allgaier got a helmet painted done by Greg. Then Greg moved to North Carolina, and now he's one of the biggest helmet painters in NASCAR. I know. Oh, wow. He's amazing. Now, yeah, do, it's pretty do, cool. Does your son now get his helmets painted as well? Yeah, from Greg. Oh, really? Yeah. Greg okay. painted Carter a, uh, his motocross helmet for the National in the summer. Okay, so cool. it was uh, it was pretty awesome. Just That was a cool feeling, knowing that my helmet painter is now painting my kid's helmet. Yeah. Like, it's, it's cool. It's special, man. When I went and surprised Carter and Greg surprised him and picked him up, you know, pick the helmet up. Uh, it was just a cool feeling. You know, Blake, um, this is all great stuff. And, and I appreciate you telling your story, but one thing I really want to touch on is one thing that I've always admired about you. You know, you are a great husband, great father. You're always a great race car driver, TV host. You're amazing at it. And we'll hopefully talk about that later. But one thing I want to get in here right now is being great at all those things. The one thing you never, ever, ever was embarrassed to talk about was God. Yeah. When, when did you have, I mean, were you brought up in a family that, you know, you went to church every single week or twice a week, or when was it that, that you found God? Yeah. I wasn't brought up in a church in a family. I went to church every week at all. Really. I, I know we went to uh, Christmas on or a uh, church on Christmas and Easter. And, um, and that was pretty much it. And I think we went to like Catholic church a few times, Lutheran church, like just went. Um, but I always believed in God. I was like, man, I definitely, I've never questioned it. Like I just believed in God, maybe just from those few times a year going to church growing up. And, um, when I was about 12 years old, um, I signed up for a youth camp that I knew a couple of my buddies were going to a, a youth group camp. And I asked my parents if, if I could go and, and they let me go and paid for it and went to Tampa and, and, um, and just around a lot of great kids. And I remember the pastor was talking about being baptized and, and surrendering your life to Jesus and not doing it on your own. And he has a great plan for us. And I got baptized in the, in the pool there at that youth camp. And it was awesome. I felt like, wow, I just feel so good. I'm ready to tackle, you know, and you were tackle 12. the world. You're 12. Yeah. yeah. But that's 12 years old. There's a lot of life changing. Absolutely. Life changes that's 12. awesome. So it's pretty crucial. But here's the thing. I got home and then you went back to your other friends and 
normal life and I wasn't around my youth group friends. And I totally um, kind of separated myself from from God and I didn't pursue God daily. And I still just, you know, kind of lived rules based, right? From 12 years old on, I was like, oh, well, I'm just not going to steal. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to break 10 commandments. That's the deal. If I can do that, I'll go to heaven and I can have fun. <laughs> right. So like, that was my mindset. I was like, I can have fun. As long as I don't break 10 commandments, I'm good. Well, like going to college, party a little bit too much, um, living a life that felt a little empty, didn't really know my purpose. Um, I was dating Shannon at the time, my wife, we were living together and I just didn't know, like, man, I was just kind of stressed out. Like, what am I going to do with, with myself? I, you know, I didn't have a NASCAR career yet. I was, you know, just kind of in that life transition when you're 20 years old. Was she a believer and, too? No, she wasn't. Okay. No. Nope. Um, and she's like, Hey, my sister is going to this church and wants us to go. And I was like, all right, let's go. You know? And I remember being, I mean, just to be honest with you, I was hung over <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I was like, all right, let's go. You know? And, and at this time in my life, uh, I'm being pretty detailed cause this is pretty important. Yeah, um, absolutely. At this point in my life, I was pressure cleaning roofs for a living with my stepdad. So, um, pressure cleaning roofs, I'm probably making $500 cash a week and with minimal bills. So I like, I was just calling it really holding on to money really tight. Like I loved having this cash and, um, and I had probably, I don't know, 800 bucks in my pocket and, uh, and that was my love at the time was just that money that I worked for and I had it. And I, and I went to church that morning and the pastor's just talking about letting go, letting go of the things that you love, letting go of the things you're holding on to and following Jesus. Jesus has this perfect plan for our life. And all we have to do is follow him and seek him and be obedient. And we can have a life better than we can possibly imagine. And I was like, man, that sounds so much better than what I'm doing right now. Because right. I have no idea what to do, where I'm going. And if God knows what he wants for me to do, I want to follow him. And for me, letting go was taking that wad of cash out of my pocket and putting it in the offering basket. And and it wasn't about money. It was just letting go of something that I loved more than him at the time. Wait a second. I and, just uh, I, I just want to make sure that everybody understands what you just said. You literally took everything, every single penny you had in your wallet and put yeah. it in the basket. Put it in the basket. You put yeah. everything that was important to you, Blake, that or or what you thought was important to you, yep. and you gave it away. Absolutely. To take yeah, Jesus to. that day. I had to. Yeah, oh, that was that's that was, amazing. That's I didn't what it know that. For me. Yeah. So for me, it was, I don't even know how much it was. 500, It doesn't matter. It know. doesn't I matter if it was $3. Yeah. It, it was and important from to that you. point, every time the offering came, I took <laughs> all the cash out of it all and put it in. And I never counted it because I didn't want to know and I didn't want to hold on to it. So that was something that I struggled with for a while was just holding on to money too tight. So that was my way of releasing to God was just giving, you know, giving it. Um, so... And like I said, it wasn't about, it's not about money. It's about letting go of something that I was holding on to Absolutely. too tightly. Yeah. So at that point, man, that was the turning point in my life where I was like, okay, I'm in my early twenties. I know what I want to do now. I'm going to pursue Jesus daily. And, uh, and from that point on, I've connected with the right people. I moved to North Carolina, joined a small group with some drivers, uh, found a great church, um, and then continue to grow every year, doing outreach events, going and serving people. And, and now what I've learned over the last two years that works really, really great for me is waking up really early. Like right now it's 530 in the morning and I go in my office and I read the Bible. I read a daily devotion. I pray and have that real quiet time where I can focus and get my day right and my priority straight before I enter the crazy day that it's going to be. So that was, that's extremely important for me right now. Mindset, right? <laughs> right. If you're going to do it, do you, it big. You know how my mind thinks. <laughs> I, I'm calling all these sponsors for two weeks and everybody's saying no. And I'm like, well, shoot, if I put as much effort into building my own business as I did from trying to find money from everybody else over these last 10 years, 
I'd be able to sponsor myself. Right. And if I if I worked as hard for my own company as I did for Leaf Filter, as I did for Celsius and Salt and all these people I promoted and all the work I'm putting in every day calling companies for sponsorship, if I put all that effort into building a company, I could sponsor myself. And that was and that's what I wanted to do. I was like, I'm just I'm just going to take years or however long it takes, build a company so I'm in a better situation, my family's in a better situation, and I'm not relying on other people to do to do things. And I don't want to ask for money anymore. And um, and then I started – I was like, well, now I – that's great. That sounds awesome, Blake, but what business are you going to start? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, speaking, of, yeah. uh, speaking of starting businesses, uh, a lot of times it's nice for the audience to know – like they might have the perception that you're a NASCAR driver and you've got the money, so of course he can start a business. But you actually were doing businesses uh, and being an entrepreneur since the time you were like 16, right, with the sign company? and. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So my first business I started, I was eight years old, actually, and I lived, me and my mom eight lived years old? together. Eight? Yeah, I was an official <laughs> business, right? But nice. me and my mom lived together. She's a single mom. We lived in a quadruplex in Florida. And there was this one dumpster where everybody had to walk to to dump their trash. And I remember saying, Mom, what if I got people to pay me? What if people put their trash out in front of their door and I walked around and picked it all up and brought it to the dumpster for them? Oh, that's so cool. I remember these these <laughs> going and knocking on doors for like $3 a week for me to go take people's trash to the dumpster. And I was making decent money as an eight-year-old doing that. <laughs> so. That was my first business. You find a need and you solve it. And yeah. People like convenience and they'll pay a little bit for it. Right. So if they're no different than filter time. There's a need. Everybody needs filters. A little bit of convenience. You don't have to remember to buy them. And the cost is the same with free shipping. Okay, awesome. I'm not asking people to do anything crazy. I'm just offering them a service to make their life easier. So it started when I was eight. And then I have yeah. a, a sign business when I was 14. And I, I did signs and worked for my stepdad, but I was making these custom stickers for dirt bike racers when I was racing dirt bikes. So oh, cool. I go to the track and take orders and, and do that. And then pressure cleaning when I was 20 with my stepdad. And so, yeah, entrepreneur my, my whole life. And, you know, I remember borrowing $2,500 from my mom and stepdad um, and loaning against the toolbox I had um, for the money <laughs> and um, to start my sign business. So, just learning about investing and paying off, paying people back and being smart with money all started at a very young age. And I was able to start filter time with very, very little investment and, and grow it into and something I'm pretty so, proud of. So right it's now. basically the same kind of thing where you, you recognize the need now where I, I know myself, I never remember, I can never remember to get the filter. Yeah. Like, right. I, yeah. I, eventually I get around to it. But so, I mean, it seems like a genius uh, move to, to figure out that, yeah, this is a subscription. Yeah. I mean, fantastic. literally I want to know, like, were you just sitting around the house and you're like, Oh, I have to go change the filter yeah. and then grab it and go, Oh, you know what? There's a need for this. Cause I don't want to go to the store. Right. Right. Like, I mean, yeah. how, did, how did it happen? Well, I, I learned how important air filters were when I went to an aller, allergy specialist when I had allergies in North Carolina. They're like, oh, buy okay. high-quality filters, change them often, that'll help you big time. Okay. So I was always pretty diligent about changing them, but I was, I'd was i always forget. It'd be like six months, and I thought it was two months. I'm like, what the heck? You know, I used to write the <laughs> dates on it. Right, and, yeah. And then do the alarm in my calendar, but right, then clear right. the alarm and forget it. Clear, like, it's just a pain, right? Right. It's a pain. So I was going to Lowe's. I have it on my notebook right here on <laughs> January 28th. <laughs> January 28th, 2018 is when I wrote down air filter auto ship um, because I went to Lowe's to buy air filters. I bought a bunch of garbage I did not need, spent a couple hundred bucks. I don't even know what I bought. Lights, I don't even know. And I pulled down my road. And I was like, I forgot to get the air filters. <laughs> The whole reason I went there, I forgot it. And I was like, oh, I, what if I could just, man, what if I just got these things shipped to my house automatically on a schedule I, tr I, I, I could pick and never had to worry or remember to go buy air filters again? That would be amazing. Man, that's awesome. That's something I can do. Everybody needs it. And then I just freaked out and didn't sleep for 10 days and just work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just started working. So 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 then so then you have the company going right. You get the website mm -hmm. up, your your box and everything. Were you actually doing everything by yourself at, at, at you know yeah, like, I mean, like, like like in the beginning? Did you have yeah. your your wife, your two kids over there, and you know not paying them? 
I'm still doing <laughs> lots of things for myself, man. Still, but yeah, my wife, I mean, yeah, I still do a lot of it myself. Boxing, shipping, I don't do myself anymore. Um, I have awesome people that pack the filters and, and ship them out. But so the, you, I thought about filter time, right? Well, that's great. Well, the domain's taken, filtertime.com. And I was like, oh, I look for it. And I'm just going to be transparent. Yeah. Four, four grand. Oh, I can't spit. It's just an idea. Four <laughs> grand? Right, right. right. I even, just to buy the domain? Um, so I bought filter-time.com. I was like, yeah, all yeah. right. I'm, and, then I, and then I'm trying to build a website myself. And then I was like, well, man. Well, well, first off, when I thought of the name, I called Trevor Bain. I was like, what do you think of filter time? He's like, it's filter time. I love it. <laughs> and uh, I was like, done. I agree. Great name. So started started telling more people about the company. And people were like, man, this is brilliant. And I was like, I can't have filter-time.com. I I can't tell people to go to filter dash time. Right. Yeah. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. So I bought that domain for 4,000 bucks and, um, and it made me sick. <laughs> when I had to do it. But sometimes you got to step, you know, take a leap of faith. And, uh, and that's what I did and, um, built a little website and then I'm driving one day. I was like, man, this is a great company, but what do I need? I need a face. I need a recognizable face where if somebody went to, cause the startups are tough. Getting people to enter their credit card information on a website that they're not familiar with is difficult. Right, right. Um, so if I had a recognizable face on there, people would feel secure. They would trust it. They'd be confident or look like a big company. And I was like, man, if there's anybody in the world, anybody, any recognizable face that fits this brand, it'd be Dale Earnhardt Jr., that's what I was thinking to myself. Right, right. He has a do-it-yourself show, remodeling. He's the everyday guy that people just relate to. Not ever heard one bad thing about him. Now, Blake, he for just, those of you that are not race fans and don't know who Dale Jr. is, he is a retired, famous race car driver. Because you got to remember, Blake, yeah. a lot of people don't know who these race car drivers are. So that's why I just want to make sure that everybody knew who he was. He was the most yeah. popular driver for like 18 years. Oh yeah. He's the most popular driver of all time. One of the most um, recognizable athletes of all time. Yeah. Just down to earth kind of guy. Yeah. Grassroots yeah, kind of guy, blue collar guy. So, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm driving and I was like, Dale Jr. If I could get him to help me, it'd be over. Like that'd be my dream. You didn't call him, and did you? I did not call him. Oh. I text him. <laughs> I text him. But I had to get his number, right? Am I going too long on time? No, yet? no, no. Okay. You're great. This is awesome. Okay. So I I had to get his number, but I was too embarrassed to call Michael McDowell or Trevor Bain or Justin Allgaier. I was like, I'm too embarrassed to tell these guys that I'm going to reach out to Dale <laughs> to help me sell air filters. <laughs> I'm just too embarrassed. I can't do it. So who did I, who did I uh, ask for it? I asked. Uh, man, I told him I would never tell anybody. Um, That's right. No one's oh, listening. Okay, I'm not gonna yeah, mention yeah. his name. We won't tell. It was my. He was my chaplain. Oh really? Was my chaplain. Okay. Yep. It was my chaplain. That's our chaplain. I like that. You didn't, like, you didn't give a name. I didn't so give a name. That's perfect. Good. So he's like, dude, you didn't get this from me. <laughs> and he sent it to me, and. uh, and I text Dale. I was like, hey, man, I decided to take all of my energy, my passion that I had for racing and put it into this new business that has everything to do about marketing and branding. And you're the best at it. I would love to pick your brain one day. Um, and he responded, sounds awesome. Would love to hear. Let's do lunch. Kelly will uh, Kelly will set something up for us. And a couple of days later, Kelly said, hey, can you do Monday meeting with me and Dale? I was like, sure, you know, and um, and I was like, oh gosh, what am I gonna talk to him about? What am I gonna, <laughs> what am I gonna ask him? You know, I'm like, I want his help. I don't know what that looks like. Right, right. So, I shared. With, I'm, you know, this is my first time meeting Dale. You know, also, like I've shook his hand at driver intros and asked him to take a picture with me and my kid once. <laughs> like I literally asked Dale, I was like, hey, could you take a picture with me and my son? Like one time when I was about to race with him at Bristol race against him because I knew he was retiring and might not ever have the opportunity. Again. Right. Yeah. So I just did it. Um, so like I walk into this meeting with Dale and Kelly and I was like, Oh gosh, 
All right. So I just started talking about how I came up with the idea. Like I told you guys, driving to the store, it's a pain in the butt. Started, you know, sharing my plans for the business. How many people in the United States have an air filter? Um, just a lot of stats, but he could see my my energy and right. my, my passion for it. And um, and he's like, well, that all sounds great, Blake, but you're here. What can I do for you? And and that's when, you know, that, that's when I had to really be bold. And I was like, I want people to go to Filter Time and see a picture of you holding a box of air filters. And he's like, okay. And Kelly's like, well, Blake – you know, um, <laughs> <That was easy. laughs> yeah, she's like, well, okay. Blake, like, you know, Dale's, you know, Dale's kind of expensive. You know? <laughs> now the business part of it comes yeah, in. Yeah. yeah. And then Dale just straight up said, Hey, you know what? I believe in you. I want to partner with you. I want to go on this journey with you. Would you consider having me, you know, partner with you as an owner? And, um, uh, and kind of just let's have fun, build a great business. Would you, would you consider letting me, you know, be an owner with you? So you, you know, walked, like, you walked in that meeting for a picture. You walked out with a partner. <laughs> I, I walked in hoping for maybe a Facebook post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like realistically, that was my goal. That yeah, is like, amazing. Yeah. And, and then I said, I would love to have you as a partner. And he says, well, great. I got to go, uh, film my podcast. So you guys figure out the best deal and, and let's do this. That's and then awesome. Kelly and I worked out a deal and, and it's been amazing. The best partner by far more involved, uh, more engaged and just better than I could have ever dreamed or imagined. There's such great people and I'm so blessed to be, to be part of, um, you know, the Earnhardt family with this, with this business and growing something great. Do you guys realize a pattern here since he was young? He wasn't afraid to ask for it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and he believed. He believed in himself, and that's why he walked out with not a Facebook post or yeah, a picture. Yeah, well, there's, there's a definite uh, a line in your story where, I mean, you're you're constantly persistent, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you're, and you're willing to ask. And, and even if you're not necessarily even wanting to or afraid to, you still had to ask. And yeah. I think that's what a lot of times the audience, you know, uh, can take away from this that, you know, it's... There's sometimes it's not rocket science or anything uh, out of the ordinary. It's just you know good old fashioned persistence. Hey Blake, you just gotta ask. And if you're, I've always believed if my intentions are right, I should never be afraid to ask. Yeah. Amen. Hey uh, Blake, we we have just about five minutes. In in what what advice could you give somebody out there? Maybe maybe they. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter if it's racing, if it's if it's being a business owner, if it's God. What advice could you? give somebody that's listening right now that might be struggling? Man, I mean, people struggle with so many different things, right? But but the only way I can get through life is starting my day in the Word, um, reading reading a verse, one verse. And for me, 10 years ago, started with one verse out of Version app. Um, and today, it's, it's a chapter or two in a devotion. But starting my day in the word pursuing God is the most important thing for me. Um, and that work and that's what works for me. But overall advice, like you guys said, don't, don't be afraid to ask. <laughs> like you'll never know if you don't ask and you can't be afraid of to hear no, and you can't be afraid to fail. But if your intentions are right and you have great motives, go ask for it, ask for the business and never give up, have goals, write them down, and do whatever you can to go achieve those goals. Thanks, Blake. Hey, Blake, I want to I, I make sure everybody knows how to get to filter time and and what you guys actually do because you do not just home filters. You do all kinds of different filters, correct? Oh, um, not right now. We just do home filters. But okay. We'll eventually offer like you know the refrigerator filters and the water filters. Oh, cool. Very cool. Whoever, who knows? Every filter you need, maybe one day. Awesome. And, so, and how can I get there? Yeah, filtertime.com. Not um, not filter dash time. It's filter no, time. Not filter dash time. It's filtertime.com. And then most people we've learned through Google Analytics are just Googling their Dale Jr. air filters. And you can get there pretty easy that way, too. Okay. <laughs> you know what? I, I saw something the other day, and you have nothing but five stars, too, which is, which is uh, through Google. And I think that's pretty cool. 
Yeah, I'm so proud of that. Google, Facebook, we have hundreds of reviews, only five-star reviews, and we're the only company, uh, air filter company, I haven't researched any other ones, but only air filter company to have that. And, and that honestly comes from Dale. He, he always said, Blake, no matter what, we take care of the customers. If they order the wrong size, tell them to keep it. We'll send them a new one. If they if a box is damaged, tell them to keep it. We'll send them a new one. No matter what, we take care of the customers, have a best customer service. If they're not happy, we refund them fully and just take care of the customer and the business will succeed. And that's kind yeah. of how uh, we're basing it. Yeah, that's amazing. Bill, you have any uh, last minute comments before I wrap things up? I just think he's got a great story. I think there's a lot to take away here from... Uh, uh, for the audience. And I uh, just really appreciate you sharing your story today. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's nice to meet you too, Bill, over the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully sure. I can meet you in person one day. Oh, definitely. I'd love that. Blake, I can't thank you enough. And I encourage all of you to go to filtertime.com. And um, I just was on there last night. So I have a question for you, Blake. I'll text you or call you afterwards so I can get on the program. But I had a 20 by 25 by five. <laughs> and then it said actual size. And I was like, what do you mean by that? So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's a lot of different twenty by twenty five by fives. So you usually have there was like to take fifteen like, of like actual if it's sizes. A Honeywell replacement or a Linux or a Tron Air Bear or a Train. All those have different little dimensions. Yeah. So you have to you have to know what brand you're replacing or the actual size. Right. Yeah. So Blake, but I then can, you never have to once you what, figure that out once you never have to worry about it again. I yeah, know. Yeah, well, yeah. that's why I'm gonna need some help later on so I can get on the program and get get mine twice a month because um. Just like you said, it, it, it's one of those things you always forget about, and then it, right. and then it's too late. You're like, well, why even do it now? Because it's already dirty. It's already been dirty for <laughs> six months. My daughter's uh, going to be ordering this afternoon because she knows I always forget. <laughs> right, awesome. exactly. Awesome. I know. It, it, and what I'm doing for my daughter is today when I got to go over there, I'm going to give her that for Christmas this year oh, for perfect. part of her deal. So if you're looking for a last-minute Christmas present, yes. make sure you go and check out filtertime.com with Mr. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Blake Cook. And Blake, I can't thank you enough for spending an hour with us here. You have a great story. You're welcome back here anytime you want, my friend. Thank you so much for having me on. I've been looking forward to it. We've been talking about it for a year. I know. I'm glad we're finally able to chat and, uh, and look forward to re-listening to this. So thank you very much. Well, thanks again, Blake Cook. This is Johnny D, the Motivational Cowboy with this week's Outstanding Life Podcast. And don't forget, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Player FM. And don't forget, you can donate now at PayPal and support on Patreon. Again, this is Johnny D, the Motivational Cowboy, telling all of you, be safe, have fun, and we'll see you next time on the Outstanding Life Podcast. Outstanding Life is a Soul Bridge Studio production.